Adams. Apologies to get me again, but I'll make it uh, quick and hopefully very interesting for you. So once again, these slides have been written by, uh, not me, our Chief Technology Officer, Dr. Fine Rebellis, who can't be with us. And uh, Juan finished these in the early hours of the morning again, so let's see what the content is. Now, Juan is normally very mathematically based, but he has promised me there's no heavy maths. So, so we've just heard about a project called uh, Super Scope, I think is the name, uh, the idea of extending this long central mass to give us a, a telescope and how that needs to be essentially a precision structure. Well, this is actually a very long um, mass system, but doesn't have to be uh, precision. It's actually a, a lower frequency uh, antenna, but the principles and the challenges uh, are still the same. So let me talk you through this. Of course, this time you already know box and space systems, hopefully. So, if I ask the question again, who's heard of OSS? Yeah. Exactly, great. So, at least we can skip two slices and just crumble through this. You know where we are? Right. On to the mission. So, once again, this is a live development we're doing for a customer um, in the US. So, it's not aspirational. We're actually working uh, on this mission at the moment. Uh, I'm not allowed to identify the customer or tell you specifically what their mission and the constellation will be doing. But I can summarize it in the points you see on the screen here. So it's a low F orbit constellation. Ideally, uh, this is actually slightly out, of, slightly out of date, they want the platform to be um, a 27U, so coming in at around about 55 kilograms, not the 80 to 100, as it's shown here. They can turn the screen more uh, on us. Uh, they want a VHF antenna. And because of the specification of the antenna, which you'll see in a moment, it gives us a really interesting design challenge in terms of uh, topological structure. Being LEO, typical operating life, five to seven years, and the antenna has to be able to operate both its TX and, and, and RMs. So they put us under contract to work on a breadboard for them and then show them an engineering model, and then if we get that right, that then trigger um, flight hardware build. And once again, to put it in the context of crazy the new space commercial world is when you're dealing with the US. Uh, we were given six months to get to engineering model and uh, we will learn uh, at the end of July whether they want the flight hardware and they will work three sets of flight hardware from us by end of Q4 2019 ready for flight 2020. Okay. And that includes all the RF analysis and range testing as well. So you appreciate we don't get too many weekends off at uh, So what I'm allowed to show you, I'm not allowed to show you any of the engineering model work, I'm allowed to show you some of the base breadboard uh, design, including uh, deployment. Okay. So as I said this morning, I'm not the RF expert, so I'm not going to label this. If there's an RF expert uh, in, the, in the audience, I'll ask me a difficult question during the Q&A. And skip over most of the RF, but I will point out one interesting thing to do well RF performance. It requires what we call an isoflux radiation pattern. Uh, in English, what that means is when you're transmitting uh, from space to a curved surface like the Earth, the easiest thing to do is just transmit, but then you get a non linear distribution of energy across the curved surface. On isoflux, we mean we want to modify the antenna performance such that on a curved surface, we actually get an even distribution of radio frequency energy. And that's driven both from technical reasons, but also from license, uh, license compliance reasons. You can't bombard certain areas of the earth with a certain level of radiation energy. It simply is a hit with the fringes by overloading those central areas, so you've got to control the level of energy. So that was a lot of challenges, actually, on the structure uh, as an antenna design. Um, so top level mechanical challenges, once again, to hit mass budgets and storage efficiency, no uh, motorized deployment, it has to be controlled, or is a controlled self-deployment structure. It has to be very structurally stiff, so it has to be fully self-supporting, so we can test it on ground, which means we lower the cost of on-ground testing. And very light, less than 2.5 kilograms of entire antenna. And we talk in terms of sort of tuna uh, tin or CubeSats. This is slightly bigger, so it's uh, essentially a paint tin. The entire antenna, which in full deployed configurations up to seven meters, we've got to fit this in a 20 centimeter or 20 centimeter tin. So 20 centimeters down, but 20 centimeters in height. 
bit I'm not going to tell you or show you about in any detail is there's actually two antennas. They want us to combine an AIS antenna as well into this structure such that we can monitor shipping. So AIS signals from ships as well as uh, VHF. So I've left off the, uh, the really dense IP bits showing you how we do the AIS. Okay, so translating this into design drivers. It's a lower frequency design VHF. Uh, you crunch the numbers and translate into a physically large antenna. You can't get away from the rules of physics. If you want to uh, receive or transmit a certain frequency, there's got to be a fraction of the wavelength. If we crunch the numbers, you actually end up with physically large structures at these lower frequencies. And because of the size of the gain they want to achieve, once again, it drives the structure uh, as well. So the solution we came up with um, is a tri-fire helical antenna. And I'll show you some images from the uh, NS Microwave Studio simulation. So I joke uh, with the guys, I say there's actually an antenna deploying a satellite. If you look at it. The little silver box at the top end is actually 27 new CubeSat. They give you an idea uh, on scale of the dimensions. So that's what we've got to be flying in 2020. So here's more challenge. So that's from a radio frequency viewpoint is what we need to achieve in terms of a structure. So let me show you how we did. Um, so some RF bots here, so the two actually on, on the left hand side, once again I said I wouldn't labour it, I'm not the RF guy, but apparently we've achieved a really good nice little flux pattern. So technically if we can achieve the helix in that configuration, we're going to get the spread of radiation patterns uh, across the earth that we're going So to solve the problem, we actually developed some interesting in-house uh, mathematical models. I told you my CTO absolutely loves maths. So, uh, anybody interviewing uh, for us, he loves taking maths from first principles. So, he's a whiteboard, and a whiteboard marker, second and third order differential equations, and he's a uh, math fiend. So, a lot of work is done in MATLAB, and we develop our own proprietary modeling tools uh, before we then use more conventional tools. Uh, so, we developed a lot of internal models to verify how the structure. to uh, show you some of the uh, additional tools that we put together. Um, the top right hand corner has just appeared. I mentioned uh, the modelling of this material uh, this morning. For those that work here uh, this morning on the board again, so here's this magic flex concept that we're working on. The top right hand corner uh, there is a screenshot of a tool that we developed by working with the Advanced Composites Lab at Bristol University with government funding. Essentially, what I've done is, is hired a material scientist and basically commercialized his PhD work. He spent a lot of time working out the nonlinear mathematics to predict how this material would behave. So, what we've done is written a mathematical toolkit so that we can take customer specifications and feed in. It tells us the layout of this material and then how we behave in space environments. So this is a live, evolving of software uh, which underpins a lot of the developments of human science. I presented in the, in the US actually, and uh, it wasn't Lucky Martin, I think it was Chloe, uh, came up to me and said, uh, Mike, really like this, this tool, because I was giving a more in depth presentation. Like, can we buy can we buy this tool from you? Uh, and I said, You can, but it's going to cost about 50 or 60 million. You'll have to buy the company around it, because this is part of our core uh, IP. So we know it's a very good software. Okay, so we looked at a whole range of materials that we could actually build the breadboard and, and the engineering model from. We looked at glass fiber, uh, brilliant copper, uh, and then we looked at more exotic materials such as mitanol in super elastic uh, configuration. We settled on um, glass fiber um, for, uh, for the particular breadboard flight model. Uh, and the reason for that uh, is cost, commercial availability, and it's very easy uh, to work with. And we could rapidly uh, uh, iterate uh, records. In terms of physical uh, characteristics, we slightly exceeded the stowage volume. This is coming at 0.25 rather than 0.2, but the customer's accepting of that because we get their mass budget. And we agreed because of budget uh, restrictions at this level, we would build a half scale model. So we built and tested a 3.5 meter uh, record. 
and on-ground testing, uh, once again, had to be very cheap, so we could not afford, the customer would not pay for any exotic parameter off moving rigs. So we wanted essentially a self-supporting antenna for the cheap. So, if the video will play in just a moment, what you're looking at is the fully deployed half-scale uh, antenna, and it actually looks I think, quite, quite beautiful. This is where the art of origami comes in uh, as well. Uh, we're using uh, the material to generate some really interesting use of, of straight energy through the structure. So let's see. So you can see it's got a lot of strain energy. It really wants to deploy. Thermal uh, cycle uh, mats and subjected to sort of aging for its bed uh, to make sure it can uh, generate the level of energy that we need. And this will actually stand up on its end under 1G. It's a surprising uh, Okay, we have time. Good. I just want to show you a couple of flights, uh, projects that we're working on that are based on those principles. So I mentioned this, this material. Uh, we're actually flying it on orbit at the moment, so this is not aspirational. Um, I promise I noticed actually, I thought we could spend months, maybe even years, convincing ourselves in the lab this might work. Uh, and I looked at how much it was going to cost us. I thought this is crazy. It just makes more sense to get on and fly this when you, when you crunch some numbers, then at least we prove this thing works. So we'll be showing animation, then some photographs of what we're doing on orbit. So here's this material being deployed. We call it our astrotube boom, and it is being deployed not not violently, but on its own. We control the deployment of the mechanism. Here's our first ever HD image uh, from from orbit. The boom partially uh, deployed, and uniquely we can retract the boom and it's not. so we can partially and fully deploy it better than millimeter precision accuracy uh, on orbit. So we spent the last 16 months deploying and retracting the boom to validate all the kinematic predictions we've made of this material. It's all silver in the plate. Um, that should have been holding a camera, looking back at the platform. So I proposed to the UK Space Agency who part funded this mission, can I put a camera at the end of the boom? And they said, look, your material's crazy enough and high risk enough, we're not going to let you risk a camera at the end of the boom. So we actually went ahead and designed the camera mounting plate just in case. But we got through CDR when they had a change of heart. I said, Mike, can I get the camera in the loop? We really like it, can we do it then? Of course, it was too late we through CDR. So that's the camera that never was. <laughs> but it serves as a great, uh, way, a great way of verifying whether the material is undergoing axial distortion because we see that plate uh, rotate uh, out of truth. And then the last thing, Closing couple of minutes. Here is another live mission we're working on that I'm allowed to talk about because this is in the public domain. Uh, we want to contract with Defence and Science Technology Lab, or DSTL, essentially the UK government uh, defence lab, to work with Talas Alenia Space on this 27U uh, platform. And we'll be deploying the helical that you can see here. So we're doing all the control electronics the mechanism such that we can deploy a helical antenna. You notice the diameter is greater than the stowed uh, base. And this is where origami comes in again. You can probably recognize this material. So this will be a very controlled deployment of the precision. I'm not allowed to say exactly what it's doing, but you'll read on the website that it's monitoring things to do with the ionosphere. And I'll leave it at that. Uh, this will be on orbit in 20. And that's it. Slot ahead of time. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Uh, yeah. uh, first of all, sorry, I got your name wrong in my talk. Did uh, you? I, I think you say Lawson. That was, that's close enough. <laughs> Uh, um, oh, very nice talk, Mike. Um, so my question is, uh, have you got any information, uh, any experience of, of um, how quiet the space environment is? You've got that long boom sticking out, 
Uh, have you got any information about how it sort of wangs around and how, and how quickly vibration is damp and stuff like that? Uh, yes, we have from this particular mission. We're looking at the, the Enox uh, system, but it's uh, a very tunable material, so we can put in, uh, we can modify the kinematic behaviour across a wide range of mission requirements. Can you give me any numbers? Uh, I can under NDA. Yes, <laughs> okay. have to have that conversation. Okay. Any further questions?